as you march in the theatrics of everything and the performances and like the people kind of performing and dancing around you as you walked in and then you like walk through the tunnel and like all the bright lights are on you that was when it hit me um you could see there were tv cameras everywhere and when i was holding my phone up videoing the surrounding area while i was like looking around i could feel my phone just vibrating so people are obviously seeing us walking through or maybe more specifically seeing me on tv What's up, guys? Thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast. Before we start, this is a quick announcement to let you guys know that I'm dropping bonus episodes on Auxoro Premium. For $3 per month, two if you sign up for the year, you get a two-hour bonus episode every month of my show, The Ox, that covers exciting and sometimes twisted topics like MK Ultra, the COVID lab leak hypothesis, Tim Dillon, Tom Cruise, the Tuskegee experiment, the obesity epidemic, and more. You also get monthly solo episodes with my takes on drugs, sex, money, creativity, mindfulness, and you have the ability to submit topic suggestions for both of my shows, The Aux and The Auxoro Podcast. Expect three hours of new exclusive podcast content per month, including access to all archived episodes found nowhere else but Auxoro Premium. Visit auxoro.supercast.tech to sign up today. Only $3 per month, two if you sign up for the year. Again, that's auxoro.supercast.tech. Link is also in the episode notes. Come join the premium gang today. Now let's get to this episode. This episode is special because I recorded it with my best friend and professional baseball player, Jonathan DeMarty. I've known John since 2011 when we first started playing baseball together at the University of Richmond. We've been through the ringer. We've played together. We've seen each other be immature as fuck. We've seen each other grow up. We've seen each other get fucked up, (laughs) grow up and get fucked up. We've seen each other battle injuries. John has battled much more injuries than me and John is someone that I admired. He's been through a lot of really frustrating and just hard as fuck injuries to deal with as a baseball player. He's had shoulder injuries. He's had elbow injuries. He had this thing where he got mesh put in his stomach because a hernia, sports hernia. And these aren't just, you know, getting your elbow scraped out, quick arthroscopic surgeries. These were heavy recovery, six to 18 months for some of these. And and John has been through all of it. He's still playing professional today. And he just got back from Japan. He played for Team Israel in the 2021 Olympic Games. And so I was fortunate enough to witness that journey leading up to it. Had many conversations with John. I got to see him play. And that was exciting to see my friend walk out into the Olympic ceremony, the opening ceremony, to see him pitch in front of millions of people. And we get into all that on the podcast. We get into the journey of making it to the Olympic Games. We get into steroids, me taking steroids, not John. We get into some some hypothetical steroid situations. We get into what, what would it be like to play drunk? How drunk could you get and still be an effective pitcher in baseball? We talk about UFC. We talk about getting the fans rowdy in baseball, how to get some more fan attention onto the, the game of baseball, which if I'm I'm being honest is my first true love after my mom i mean it's got to be baseball i i spent 15 plus years of my life wanting to be a professional baseball player until that dream came to an end after college after battling a couple of injuries myself but nonetheless this episode is not about me so i'm gonna stop rambling let's get into it this episode is about my best friend professional baseball player motherfucking olympian jonathan demarty let's dive in Thank you for joining me, John. I, I appreciate it. So thanks for hopping on the podcast. Thanks for having me, Zach. So tell me the the story of how you ended up playing in the 2020 Olympic Games for Team Israel. Because as your friend, you've told me the the parts as it's been happening. So I found out things about qualifying and then you eventually making it to Tokyo. But I don't think I've ever heard you describe, you know, how you linked up with Team Israel, that whole process of getting through the qualifiers and then actually getting to the Olympics all in kind of this one put together story. So for people who are not aware, you pitched for Team Israel in the 2020 Olympic Games. 
can you tell that story of, of how you got to Tokyo and, and how you linked up with Team Israel Baseball? Yeah, so um, it was my, it was 2018. It was my first full season of independent ball. And I didn't really know much about the like international baseball scene. I always thought it would be something um, cool to be involved in. Uh, but like, the you know, the goal of playing indie ball is more so to try to get signed and play affiliate ball. So um, kind of learned more about like the uh, Latin American um, winter leagues while I was playing. And one day the manager that I had at the time uh, in normal Illinois in the frontier league, he asked me if I was interested in playing winter ball anywhere. And um, I said, actually, I would love to play for team Israel. Um, not knowing that this was still a thing. Um, I don't know if you remember this. I don't think you stayed with us at McGuigan's house and I kind of watched a little bit on my own our sixth year, but uh, when we were playing at Texas, I watched a bunch of the Israel World Baseball Classic games. And then again, when we were back in Richmond, so I knew that there was a team, but I didn't know that there was any upcoming events or didn't really know how the whole European scene worked. Um, so anyway, our manager at the time was friends with Gabe Kapler, uh, who was previously involved in Team Israel. And he called me the next day and said to expect a call from someone involved with Team Israel. Um, on the flip side, at the same time, Nate Mulberg from one of our coaches at Richmond our last year mm -hmm. knew the manager of Team Israel. And he told him about me and told him uh, that I was Jewish. Our manager's from the same uh, county in New York that I'm from. And he knew who I was, but didn't know I was Jewish because, because of my last name. So this kind of all happened at the same time. But from my perspective, then that next day, I actually got a call from our manager. And uh, he was basically like, Jonathan, like, you might not know who I am, but I know who you are. I had no idea you were Jewish uh, because of your Italian sounding last name. Um, mm -hmm. If you're healthy and willing to put in what it takes to become an Israeli citizen, um, uh, we'd love to have you on the team. And I said, absolutely. This is something I would love to be involved in. I literally started... Uh, making Aliyah and you know, like all the paperwork necessary to become mm -hmm. a citizen like the next day. And that was like kind of a continuous process over the next few months of that season. And then I think it was maybe like a week or so after that season ended, myself and nine other guys went on a trip to Israel to finalize our citizenship and like officially make Aliyah. Um, so I was on that, that first group of 10 American born guys who became Israeli yeah, citizens. To, uh to stop to stop you for a sec so the coach of team israel the one that reached out to you he was kind of following your baseball career he was obviously aware of how you were performing but he just didn't know that you were jewish he didn't know that you were eligible to play for team israel and then he reached out to you yeah that's correct um somehow like you know it went from the manager i had at the time through gabe kapler then to peter kurz who was our general manager and then once they found out, I guess I was someone from Westchester County where our manager, Eric Holtz, was also from. They made that connection and he called me literally the next day. So the process started pretty quickly and then there was there was no turning back. And a bunch of guys from that first trip that I was on did, in fact, play on the Olympic team. So that's that's mm -hmm. kind of how it started. And then we never played in any qualifying events together from so I made got citizenship in September of 18. The first qualifying event was in July of 2019. Mm -hmm. So, so Ga the Gabe Kapler connection, I, I feel like that's worth getting into because he might be a robot and he's the one of the largest, most ripped human beings I've ever seen uh, play a sport. And like, how how was Gabe Kapler involved in this again? What what was his connection to team Israel um, because he, he's, he's not, an absolute specimen and, and we like to bring up specimens on this podcast. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. That's one thing we both, uh, we both have loved to talk about is our bodies yeah. have fluctuated through injury and various types of fitness, uh, where I see you swinging mace clubs around and doing crazy movement stuff in your, uh, in your bedroom. Um, oh, hundred anyway. percent. I'm going to take, I'm going to take an intermission during the podcast. I'm going to swing a mace. I'm going to do some three sixties for about 15 minutes and that gets the blood flowing for the second half. <laughs> oh my God. Um, so get, I really don't fully know his involvement. I forget if he managed or was an assistant coach on one of the qualifying teams for the world baseball classic years before, 
But I know once he got into a managerial position, he kind of had to step away from that. I think he was with the Phillies at the time. Mm -hmm. And this was before he became the manager of the Giants. But I know he was on the coaching staff and probably helped put together the roster for the previous qualifiers. Because there was two times before for World Baseball Classics where Israel was in the qualifiers and almost made it to the Classic, but unfortunately did not. I can't, I don't think he was actually in the dugout for the 2017 team or anything like that but he might have been involved in the qualifiers in 16 for that and then mm-hmm. pre- previous events but ever since my involvement he was he he was not a part of yeah. it yeah so how does the cuz this this was a little bit confusing to me so how how does the whole c- citizenship process or, or the cuz I was confused when I, I first heard about you, heard you tell me about Team Israel, and, and you're obviously Jewish, but you're not actually an Israeli citizen, or you weren't at the time. What is special about Israel, and what allowed you to actually play for Israel being Jewish, but not actually being a citizen? Because when I'm in my head, when I'm thinking, you know, someone's going to, you know, play soccer for Nigeria they have to have some sort of affiliation with Nigeria they can't just be a religion from the country so how, how did that all happen What's yeah up, I mean- guys this is a quick break in the episode to remind you that if you like this conversation you'll love Auxoro premium go to auxoro.supercast.tech to gain access to bonus episodes the ability to suggest topics and all premium archives for only three dollars per month two if you sign up for the year again that's auxoro.supercast.tech link in the podcast notes now back to the episode yeah i mean it's interesting because not all israelis are jewish and i never really understood that concept until i went there and had it explained to me um but like with the law of return in israel i think it's if you have at least one jewish grandparent and can prove that then you have the ability to go back to Israel and make your citizen or and get your citizenship. Um, and a big part of, you know, being Jewish is returning like to the homeland, like exploring your identity, um, like where the, where religion began in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, I think that's why Americans are also able to do birthright trips. But, um, so long as you Mm -hmm. have that one Jewish grandparent, you are able to get your citizenship. You are also supposed to live there for six months when doing this. So that was the only real catch. We did not have to do that because most of us were playing um, professional baseball at the time. So there was, there was no way that would have worked. They're just the, the, the athletic facilities and fields and all that are not enough yet to be able to house guys like that in the off season. Um, so we did not have to live there for the six months. I know one of the guys on my trip actually did live there for six months. Um, and then if you fall into that age, I think that 19 to 21 age range, you're supposed to also serve in the, um, in the IDF, which obviously we Mm -hmm. did not have to do. We were all past the age of 21. Um, I know one of the things I had to do was get a letter from my rabbi basically saying that I think it was like my family belonged to this temple for my whole life. Um, show that I was bar bar mitzvahed when I was 13. So it was actually a pretty straightforward process for me. It was just like, you know, there's a lot of time spent on the phone with uh, people in Israel, like finalizing the paperwork and just proving our uh, Jewish identity. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much how, how the process works. So I would assume that even, I know you have a Jewish parent. I think it would act, if you wanted to, it would be something that you could do as well. So, so if, say I, I started taking steroids tonight, which is not out of the, the possibility, you know, I'm sure in New York, you can get your hands on anything. So let's say, say I did a, a sketchy steroid deal tonight and six months from now, I was throwing 103 miles per hour from the left side, just absolutely nasty slider, just sitting 101 topping out 103 miles per hour and I approached team Israel and I said hey if I if you pay for me to live in Israel for six months if you you pay for me to go party in Tel Aviv I'll keep my end of the bargain I'll keep injecting steroids I'll keep throwing you know once a week because you know I'm so juiced up I don't need to actually have that big of a routine would 
that be a situation where I could then follow through and play for Team Israel and join you in 2024? Um, would the juice be out of your system by the time we go and play in the next event? Yeah, I, I would probably, you know, I, I'd either do that or I'd disguise it. Um, maybe in like real juice boxes, like I would, I would mix it into a, a juice box and I, I would take it there. So no one would, no one would suspect it. Actually, it's a, a funny, a funny thing. Um, so I don't know if you've been following the whole boxing thing with Jake Paul. Have you been looking into that at all? Like, uh, the YouTuber Jake Paul? No, I know who he is, but I've not been following. So he's started a boxing career, a le legitimate boxing career. He knocked out Ben Askren. He just beat another guy, Tyron Woodley, who's a tested fighter. He can, you know, throw his hands. He's a respected fighter or was a respected fighter in the UFC. And he just beat Tyron Woodley. And he's this YouTube sensation that has now transformed himself into a boxer. And he did an interview where someone asked him about PEDs or there was alleged PED use and Jake Paul's response was like look at me like I like how could I be on PEDs I'm literally about to go for a run and eat an ice cream cone that was his response he's like yo I'm eating ice cream right now like how could I how could I be injecting um testosterone or uh Winstrol into my butt cheek when I'm literally just like eating this ice cream cone so it obviously worked for Jake Paul, so I would just, I, I probably wouldn't stop, but I would just walk around uh, wherever the next Olympics is, just licking an ice cream cone and <laughs> trying to throw people off because according to Jake Paul, there's no way that the two can be in your system at the same time. Wow. I've never thought of it that way. Well, I mean, I can tell you that I have never... I have never taken anything like that, and I consume ice cream. You've never eaten ice basis. cream? No, no, that's that's not. I was gonna say <laughs> I consume ice cream on a daily basis, but there has never been any uh, any PED uses. So I like that though. I mean, with the success that it sounds like he's had, maybe I maybe this needs to become more of a staple. Yeah, no, I'm 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 just good because you're you're still you, you have your whole career in front of you. I'll just act as like an experiment. <laughs> for you if, if you're thinking about taking anything like you can just give it to me <laughs> and i'll just be the the lab experiment you keep in your house and you can just like feed me and clothe me and and that'll be my job I'm, I'm cool with that i'm down i will i will take you up i will take you on for that so so after after you linked up with team israel and you got past the the citizenship you met the coach you kind of had an idea of what the whole olympic situation would be like then what like what what was the situation because you you were playing baseball at the time you were getting ready for the olympics i know you went on a, a qualifying tear through europe what then led up to uh you know first thinking that you're going to play in 2020 of course and then the olympics got moved to 2021 but before that even came into your mind where the 2020 olympics could possibly not happen and ended up not happening. What was your process or team Israel's routine? Like shit they were, what were you doing? How are you uh, getting ready for it? Things like that. Yeah. So got to think back. Um, we qualified in the end of 2019, early in 2020, the team went on a trip to Israel to do like a bunch of media um, stuff, kind of show their faces around the city um, mm -hmm. A lot of stuff in uniform around the city. Um, I know there were pictures of like the guys in Tel Aviv in their uniform, like doing photo shoots, talking to people on the streets. Um, I actually was not on that trip because I was playing ball in Australia at the time. So mm -hmm. um, I went on a trip by myself after that to kind of do some of the stuff that they did and some of like the medical clearance that we had to do. And then we were supposed to have a training camp again in like same thing as what happened this year, but I guess in July of 2020 for a few weeks building up to the olympics um so that's pretty much all that would have happened because everyone if you're if you were playing minor league baseball or independent ball or whatever it is you would have been um you would have been playing your season either your team would allow you to come to camp and be a part of the team for a few weeks before the olympics or you would meet the team a day or two before camp ended and uh 
fly to Tokyo with the team. So that's what the whole build up to the Olympics would have been. I mean, guys are from guys on our team are from all over the place and you have people who are retired and came out of retirement. You have guys that were presently playing and then we had a few college guys on our team. So people were all mm -hmm. over. So to really bring this group together is difficult. Um, we're also lucky that like a lot of the guys are from the Northeast, Southeast or West Coast. So a lot of guys know each other, have crossed paths. We've all become really tight, uh, knit, or tight group of friends. Um, so I've overlapped with so many guys training at different times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a, a random day that I'm home, I'll go to our manager's facility and see guys from the team or, or, or guys that are closer to the New York City area. Um, so that's pretty much it officially that would have happened for the team. And then in, 2000, in uh, 2021, this year, it was pretty much the same um, timeline of training camp leading up to the Olympics. And we had guys that were playing minor league ball that were arriving, you know, five days before we left, two or three days before we left. One of my friends, we actually, when we were checking into the village in Tokyo, we ran, we met up with him there because he was taking a flight from playing on the West coast and met up with us in Tokyo. So um, we kind of came from yeah. all over the place, but that was, that was really the grouping of guys that came together. So what was it like traveling with Team Israel? Were you, were you sketched out at all because of the past attacks on on Jewish athletes? Was you know were guys just you know did it, did they hand out machine guns the first day and be like it's up to you you know protect yourself like like what was what was the vibe like when you were traveling and were there any moments where you were like oh fuck this is an actual threat and and they're taking this really seriously. Yeah, I mean, first of all, there were definitely no weapons in the village, um, <laughs> even with all the Israeli security that was there. Yeah. Um, I, I never felt unsafe. Um, never never one time did I feel unsafe. We were not allowed to travel with anything with, like, Olympic rings on it or, like, a Star David, nothing really representing Israel. We, we couldn't wear anything like that whenever we would travel. Um, and I wore, I mean, I wear that stuff when I train and you know, when I'm with Team Israel, but that's about it. Just don't want to bring too much attention to it. Um, but no, I never, besides, I never felt unsafe from the traveling standpoint. I feel like even throughout COVID and everything, like it's almost like, yeah, getting on an airplane is, is, uh, is obviously risky, but there's a lot worse things that you can do to get yourself sick or in this situation, draw attention to yourself. Um, I will say where I felt it was in training camp. Um, we had security, but like every stadium we played at was like a different setup. So anybody could kind of like infiltrate the security and set up in a different way if they really wanted to. And I remember mm -hmm. when we played our first game together in Brooklyn, I'm sure you've been to the Cyclones Park. Yeah. So not the Coney Island side, but behind home plate, there's like a bunch of high rise buildings around. And when we were shagging BP in the outfield, we were talking to, some guys about it or guys on our team were like, you know, any, anybody that hates Israel or hates Jewish people could easily be camped out in one of these buildings that's overlooking the field. And I remember that thought re-entered my mind during the anthem that day. And like my heart was, my heart was racing. And that was really the only time that I felt it. Um, there was a few, um, a few protests outside of the stadium of our games during camp, but they were nonviolent. And I mean, there was, a handful of people there protesting. It wasn't anything crazy. And we had far more security than there was people outside protesting. So I felt, I felt really safe the whole, the whole time playing for this team. So, so was the security strapped up? Like, did they have guns on them or was it more just like they were there as a presence to deter people? Um, no, they, yeah, they were, I mean, there was like secret, service type security there mm -hmm. there was major league baseball security there and those people um did not have weapons or anything but there was i mean there was so much um police uh you know there, I mean, there was a lot of people protecting us i mean there were guys in vests and had automatic rifles outside the stadium inside the stadium that were there to protect us at all of these games it was all different levels of security i mean there was security beyond the security that we saw that was there and the Israeli security guys are very, <clears throat> very secretive as well. So, I mean, we were well protected at all times in the village. Nobody was armed. There was no, no weapons or anything. Even, even the Japanese security, there was 
maybe they had batons, but I think that was it. Yeah, I I told you I I just got back from Colombia, and yeah. I'll I'll probably talk a little bit about the more about the experience on uh, the podcast whenever it comes up. But you you talking about the the Israeli security made me think of traveling through Colombia, which. I felt very safe the entire time. You definitely have to be smart and be careful. And Colombia also has that whole narcos reputation and kind of romanticized, you know, dangerous cocaine, like don't go here. It's just basically guns in the street in America. And I I felt very safe, but having the, it was a weird feeling having guys on a lot of the corners that were policemen with bulletproof vests and machine guns it made me feel like Mm -hmm. i was okay but then also in the back of my mind i would think why like what is the reason that they're here like what happened two years ago or or 10 years ago in this spot where now they have guys with machine guns that are walking around or you know I'd, i'd be sitting down for dinner and sizing up some of the security guards where i'm like is that guy about to take a bullet for me while I'm sitting here taking a tequila shot or, or eating seafood, mariscos, whatever, I'd be like, yeah, that guy, you know, he, he looks a little bit soft. He needs to go back and, and, and do some more training. And then I would see like a huge guy with a machine gun, like absolutely ripped. And I, I'd feel like this guy, if anything went down, he was just, he, he would just annihilate everyone in two seconds. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, it definitely brings it, it. It brings different thoughts to your mind. I think at the end of the day, you just have to realize that anything can happen anywhere. I mean, the fact that in the Munich Olympics, people were able to inf- infiltrate the village so easily and um, take those Israeli athletes hostage, although it was so many years ago, is still a terrifying concept. And just a reminder that anything can happen anytime. Doesn't matter what the event is or or um, where you are and. I definitely was nervous the first time I went to Israel and saw 19 year old boys and girls walking around with automatic rifles who looked like they could be 14. Yeah. Um, that, that was pretty scary to see for the first time. But then you kind of get, yeah. you, you, you got to realize that these people that live in Israel experience this and see this on a daily basis. Same thing with you being in Colombia. And I mean, we had security with us everywhere that we went, everywhere we played, everywhere we practiced. So you kind of just, it's always a little bit like nerve wracking and makes you think twice the first day, but um, you know, it's, it's protection that like, thank God we're, we're able to have. And just so long as you carry yourself the right way and don't draw unnecessary attention to yourself, like you're, you're going to be safe. So I never, I never really felt anything at any time, especially when I was in the village, I would say actually walking around the village, there was like one or two times where I was walking by myself and you're just kind of thinking about anything. And there was this area between like the cafeteria and the gym where like the gates would open up and there was so much again so much security there like Mm -hmm. facial recognition scanning our scanning our credentials um different stuff like that before you could even get in the village and like scanning your bags through but like i said there's this area where a gate opened up and trucks would come in and drop i'm assuming waters food other goods Mm -hmm. and stuff that were needed in the village every day and in my head i was like you know, if anyone wanted to sprint through the gate at this time, like there's nobody has weapons or real protection here to stop someone. So something could happen. So there's like one or two times where the gates open and there was a delivery being made. And I would kind of like scurry past and get my way to the gym to get out of that area. But I think that was just, you know, just thoughts that you kind of put in your own head. But I mean, they're, they're very real. Anything could happen. Yeah. I was, I was reading about an explosion that happened in the Afghanistan evacuations that have been going mm-hmm. on the the past few weeks. And, you know, it's all, all over the news and United States pulling out. And there was an explosion at the airport that killed a bunch of, bunch of soldiers. I think it might have killed other civilians as well. And I heard one of the generals talking about it. And he said that basically you have to have checkpoints to check people in to the restricted area. And that many times is the most dangerous place to be because you need to have a place where you check people. 
And so if someone yeah. comes up with a, with a suicide vest, with like a, a bomb strap to their chest, like this guy did in Afghanistan, you have to stop him at some point or else he can just walk right into the airport and he probably would have killed even more people. But those soldiers that are clearing cars at checkpoints that, you know, could have shit in the trunk or uh, someone walks up with something under their clothes or, or whatever, that's an extremely scary situation. And I have a lot of respect for the people that are, putting themselves at those type of checkpoints, no matter what organization they're, the, they're a part of, where they're trying to clear people that have weapons or, or there's a, there's a, a higher risk than other areas of the world. Yeah. I mean, you gotta be thankful for people that are willing to put themselves at risk like that every single day, especially when you're, like you said, in a situation like that, where you're probably more at a higher risk for, um, attack and you know maybe in mm. Japan it was a similar kind of feeling for those guards knowing that this was the first time there was an Israeli team there again in so many years um, and especially with so many eyes on this year's Olympics given the fact that it was delayed a whole year um, and you know just life is not going on the same way I know it was something that a lot of people were tuning into and aware of that were happening so with that higher level of awareness there's a higher chance of something happening so yeah I mean we got to be thankful for all the people that are there that put their life on the line to protect us. Yeah. So I, w I want to change gears a little bit and talk about the actual um, Olympic Village, because there's a lot of speculation about what goes on in the Olympic Village. You know, as a, as a high school, college kid, I thought that the best part about going to the Olympics would be the absolute sex fest that goes on in the Olympic Village. And obviously you're in a beautiful relationship, so that doesn't apply to you. But as like, just like the vibe of the Olympic Village, and of course it's gonna be different during COVID. What, what was it like when you first walked in? What, what surprised you? You know, what was kind of strange? What, what, what was cool about it? What, what, what were your overall thoughts about the Olympic Village now that you've went through the whole experience? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely, from what we were told, way, way different than past years on so many levels. Um, I mean, number one, you're masked the entire time in the village, so conversation is a little bit more difficult. Um, when we walked in, I'm trying to think, we got there late at night, and so the real the first experience was, you know, we were traveling all day and hadn't eaten, you know, all day. So, you know, we threw our things in the room and um, threw our things in the room and uh, went straight to the dining hall. So didn't really see as much right away. But I couldn't believe how many athletes when I got there were like coming back from the gym, coming back from matches or events at you know, at midnight, there was just so much going on. And like, you know, you had people that were probably passed out waking up at 5 a.m. for an event somewhere pretty far off site. And then you had people coming back from matches, people training, um, eating at all different hours of the night. So I think just like the shape and size of all these different athletes that you would see on a daily mm -hmm. basis walking through was insane. Like I've never, you know, walking through like the Robin Center at Richmond, obviously every athlete had like has a distinct look and you stand out on a college campus wherever you are. This was insane because it was everybody. Every single person was just looked like they were in the most incredible shape of their lives. Um, and I, I couldn't believe how tall and, um, a lot of the female athletes were. I'm assuming a lot of it was track, volleyball, and, uh, and basketball. But there was also so many sports that you don't even realize that exist in the Olympics that were there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was like such a people watching scene in the gym and the cafeteria. It was just like, holy crap, like where do all these, where the hell do all these people come from? And um, I mean, a lot of these people devote their entire lives to training to be ready for the Olympics. Whereas, you know, our roundabout way here was a little bit different. So uh, the village was cool. Um, uh, I for, Also for me, like the gym was insane because you would see all different styles of training like you could see influence from different types of people or um how each country kind of did differently more specifically each sport mm -hmm. i know what i'm used to seeing in more of like a sports-based uh higher level performance center in the u.s and it was a lot different here i mean you see like people playing handball like in the gym in one corner you see like um 
like the uh, synchronized swimmers, like they had these really cool like platforms that they would literally like balance upside down on so they could still practice their routine outside of the pool. Yeah. You'd see like judo, um, all different types of fighting and sparring going on. And these people like, I mean, you know, from doing Muay Thai now, I did Taekwondo up until I was like 13 or 14 years old and was a black belt. And like, I was so fat, chubby, and slow back then. I thought I was good at what I was doing. These people moved so fast. Like the kicks and the punches were so insanely quick. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. That was really cool to see. And then, I mean, you know, then you'd see like basketball guys, volleyball, um, kind of doing their own style. A lot of people would like crush treadmill workouts. And then I'd look mm -hmm. over and I'd see Jose Batista crushing bicep curls and chest press every other day. Yeah. Um, uh, what, but did yeah, you I mean, ever get a chance to uh, talk to Jose Batista or have any interactions with him? I mean, it was really just small talk um, with him in the gym and he was on the bus with us. He was on our flight. Um, I talked to Emilio, Boni Emilio Bonifacio a little bit more. Um, he's uh, another veteran big leaguer that was uh, with the DR. And I remember talking to him for a bit in the weight room. Um, also, like, Ramiro Pena with Mexico, who was the Yankees prospect and played in the big leagues with the Yankees and I think a few other teams for a while. Um, but, yeah, Batista always had, like, a group of guys around him um, at all times. But, I mean, some of the guys on our team had prior relationships with him and knew him. Um, so they all <laughs> they all spoke to him and, you know, all the other kind of big league veterans that that were there. But I mean, yeah, the village was just such a such a unique place. Again, like like I said, the interactions were different. Um, I'm sure that the amount of uh, could you, intercourse that could uh, you we all have hurt. Oh, go, sorry. Go <laughs> ahead. You said intercourse. You said intercourse. So I don't want to stop you. Now you stop. Now you stop. I don't think that happened anywhere near to the extent of years prior um like i know you know it was nerve-wracking to even allow someone else in your bedroom it was nerve-wracking enough to have your own teammate in your bedroom because you don't know who they came in contact that with that day we were covid tested every single day and if you're positive i mean you're in quarantine in like a little shoebox room and it would be a real shame to have to sit there and be in japan quarantining when the rest of your team is playing um so i honestly yeah they'll probably they'll probably actually, lock you up and, and let you out for the next olympics if you tested positive for exactly. covid in tokyo they'd probably be like w w sorry dude we'll we'll uh we'll throw you in uh, a five pound dumbbell and a baseball and you can throw it against the wall and get ready for 2024 <laughs> um yeah i mean i wouldn't wouldn't be surprised but um yeah so it was yeah, it was definitely different on that end. Like, I mean, I'm sure other countries were nervous even allowing someone else from another country in their room. Um, uh, with us specifically, we were, uh, we, we occupied like three or four floors higher up in one of the buildings. And to get to our floor, there was numerous levels of security that you had to go through. And the elevators mm -hmm. only went to our first floor. And then you had to go through security to get in. So we had to take like, three flights of stairs up to the top floor every single time we came in. And if you were did not have the Israeli facial recognition, like you were not allowed even on our floor. So nobody from another, nobody from other countries could even come up um, anywhere near where we were staying. So it was a very Damn. heightened level of security. I, like I said, I kept my interactions down, especially earlier on. Cause, I mean, I was so nervous and, you know, with the injuries that I've been dealing with, I was, you know, didn't even know if there was if I was going to be healthy enough to play and uh, perform and uh, play in the team. So I didn't want to do anything else to put myself at risk. So I really kept my interactions down. Um, you yeah. kind of met people from other countries. Did you play in Cooperstown when you were younger? No, that was the one baseball tournament that I didn't do when I was younger. I did everything else like sports at the beach yeah. and, and the other random ones, but I never played in Cooperstown. Yeah, so um, it was actually kind of felt like a kid in that sense. Like the pin trading in Cooperstown is huge, and the pin trading in the Olympic Village was also a very big deal. So that was like mm -hmm. the extent of interaction that I had, especially earlier on, with um, athletes from other country and other countries. And it would kind of lead to some small talk here and there. But um, you know, you everybody said pin, kinda... pin training, pin training, like you pin, trading pin. Pin trading, like uh, I literally have ours right here, like like pins, 
Oh, so like you, you put trade on a pins uh, with other players from other countries? Other countries. Or, or... Yeah, oh, that's dope. So you were every country was supposed to bring pins there, <clears throat> and it was like a big part of you know the experience. Like I have a, I have like a display case with a lot of the stuff that I had signed by the guys, and like on there I have like a Tokyo 2020 towel with all the different pins that I traded for. So that was really like most of my interaction and like a little bit here and there with people in the weight room. Um, that kind of that kind of yeah. sounds like that kind of sounds like Burning Man a little bit because. I, I know I'm Burning Man. I've never been, but you're supposed to bring things to trade with other people. And from really? what I understand, you don't, you, you, there's no money system. If you want something, you trade it. So you make something that you're good at or you buy a bunch of things before. Really? So pins, for example, you could bring a bunch of Israeli pins for Team Israel. And maybe if a guy was sitting on a stoop playing a guitar, you would give him a pin and he would play a song. Or maybe that guy's thing really? to trade would be playing a song and, and he'd want some food from another group of people. So he'd be he'd say, I'll play this song and the guitar, belt it out a little bit. And that would be the mode of trading. So it, it sounds almost like the Olympic Village had uh, some Burning Man vibes. Is, it, is Burning Man a music festival? Yeah, it's a, it's a festival. I believe it's art, music, a display of all different types of artistic abilities, crafts, things like that. I'm I'm not entirely sure because I've never been. Um but I'm 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 down to check it out if you want to do like uh 2024, we could go straight from the Olympics to Burning Man or maybe we could even do Burning Man if it's in the same place. We could just bring it to the Olympic <laughs> Olympic Village. They could just keep the Olympic Village up, and then we'll just do a Burning Man in it after. So you want to bring the Israeli pins there and just put a target on our head? Basically, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Just it, it would not be a good idea. Um, oh my god! So great proposition. So, yeah. So you mentioned walking around with absolute physical specimens guys and gals and and people from all different parts of the world and i never got to experience walking around other people as peers as a professional athlete but i do remember at richmond where i would be in the training room with a couple basketball players or football players or maybe i walk past them in the hallway and the thought would run through my head that i'm a different species than this person Te technically we're both human but if an <laughs> alien if an alien came down to earth and put me next to an o lineman or a receiver with you know 0.4 percent body fat or a seven foot tall basketball player they wouldn't think we were the same species they'd be like this is uh one animal me it's like a a, a softer pale uh, you know, maybe a little bit cute version. And then there's this <laughs> other person that's like extremely ripped, uh, can jump nine feet in the air and can, you know, windmill dunk a basketball while they're running a route. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, you're exactly right. I mean, it was, it was literally a mix of that and just what, just way more diverse. Like, I mean, you could also, it was cool to like try to pick out what sport you thought certain people were with based on based on their body type. But yeah, I mean, you you saw everything, and it, it's funny because like baseball is like you put a lot of time in for your body, you put a lot of time in on the field, but it's also like a very unique body type. Like you have guys that are very strong in great baseball shape, and they're able to play 162 plus games a year. But like you have a dumpy front you know, in the stomach area where like some of these other athletes, like you said, were just like absolutely ripped physical specimens. And uh, it was just cool to like see like the difference in sport and it just like the difference in the way that people were built. Like baseball players definitely stood out. I mean, from already knowing who some of the guys were though, and, and then like looking at some of these guys, like the USA baseball team, you could definitely tell, like at least for me, you could really tell when it was them um versus mm. like you know some of these like taller taller girls um could have been like i said volleyball track um basketball and then like you know the smaller the smaller people like you know more like gymnastics but then there was like people who were 
I guess, doing like judo there or some form of fighting and we're in smaller weight classes. And I mean, they were like Manny Pacquiao type build where there's like no body fat and just like they look yeah. skinny with like a shirt on. But then like when they're wearing something tighter, just absolutely ripped. So yeah, that was for me because like I, I really like the fitness side of it. That was something that was um, pretty unique to to see in the weight room. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ba- baseball is a weird and unique sport in terms of the variety of body types where you can excel and be good at your job like you you can have a guy who walks out of a a ups truck and he's in a a ups driver's uniform and and no hate to ups drivers you know do a they provide a great service I'm, i'm just giving an example of a more average job and so you could have a guy that gets out of a ups truck you wouldn't think twice about it. And then also you could put him in a baseball uniform and he's like a left fielder and he might be the best left fielder in all of baseball. But for something like an O-lineman or you have just an absolutely shredded receiver or someone who plays basketball, you know when you pass a guy in the NFL. You know when you pass a guy in the NBA. There are a lot of guys that play Major League Baseball that get paid hundreds of thousands millions of dollars a year that if they walked down the street and i wasn't a fan of that team i would have yeah. no idea based on just looking at their body that they were the most talented or part of the most talented group of baseball players on the planet yeah i mean i think with baseball you see a mix of that you see guys who might you know i remember when noah Syndergaard was living in i think in manhattan and there were always spottings of him on the street and people trying to take pictures of him because he obviously he stands out and then there's people that like you said you would never be able to pick them out of a lineup and say they played big league baseball and that's why i think baseball is so unique because a lot of people have that natural ability and instinct and hand-eye connection that really helps put it all together and then there's other people where you have to you know create that that body and that Mm-hmm. ability to perform every single day um you kind of have to create that yourself and that's why you see so many different shapes and sizes in the sport and i wish that uh i wish that fans and people that follow baseball would be more appreciative of the unique skill that goes into it yeah because it's sometimes it's hard to tell like you look at a guy on the field and he might not look he he's he's probably big because because most baseball players are are much uh, bigger than the average person who's walking around like me like five five eleven 175 like you you'll get you get guys that are big and muscular and they'll have some fat on them in baseball but to know the sport of baseball you really have to appreciate the skill and there are a lot of things that happen that I can appreciate because I know how hard that thing is to do in the sport of baseball. Like, like if I see a first baseman pick an awkward hop, it's, it's, uh, the ball bounces, you know, it's not right in front of them. The, The shortstop makes a bad throw. It doesn't bounce right in front of their glove. It's not a long hop. It's kind of an in between hop. Like if someone, chucked a baseball at your shins and then they pick it smoothly for me i know because i've made bad throws and because i had a a short-lived career at at first base in high school how hard it is to do a simple thing like that but if you if you're a if you're someone who's never played the sport you wouldn't know and that also applies uh for me with other sports i have no idea what makes a good play in soccer because i played for you know, two years and, and never played at a high level. I, I don't know rugby. I, I I don't really appreciate a lot of things about other sports because I never played them myself and I don't really have a good understanding of the game. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. I think that's, that's a great example of like something that people don't appreciate is like when a ball is thrown 85 to 95 miles an hour across the infield, you have no idea what kind of rock it's going to hit or which direction it's going to go. And I mean, these guys are so guys at higher levels levels are so good. I mean, they don't even worry about where their body is behind the ball, like whether they're going to get hit or not, because they trust their hands and the ability to pick the ball out of the dirt that well. One thing I actually noticed with that that stood out to me that I had never seen. I've seen it on TV. I've seen it going in person to watch games. I've seen it as you go from like 
you know, high school to college, college to professional mm-hmm. level, and then the different levels there are like middle infielders and third baseman, like how quickly they get rid of the ball. It's insane. And it's almost to me mm-hmm. like a comparison of like watching the hands of a fighter or someone like that and how quickly they move, but then take into consideration the fact that someone's throwing you that ball again mm-hmm. at a high velocity. You have to catch, transfer, worry about, you know, base runner taking your feet out, sliding into you, touching the base mm-hmm. without looking to it and deliver the baseball to first base as quickly as possible. And with us, we had Ian Kinsler playing second and we had a guy who's in AAA playing shortstop for us. Their hands were stupid. Like it was, it was such a different level than anything I had ever um, experienced and played with. I mean, I've, and I've seen or played with guys who like maybe there's a shortstop, a second baseman or a third baseman who are like that. And then we also had Ty Kelly at third base. So it was like third base, shortstop, mm-hmm. second base. All three of these guys were so athletic, so quick, and it was like a unique skill that cannot be taught. Like when I played third base in college, mm-hmm. I took thousands and thousands of ground balls that summer. And for those two years that I played the infield, and I was horrible, like could not get the ball mm-hmm. out of my glove to save my life. And at times in practice, I could kind of loosen up, mess around a little bit and let it go. But once it came time in a game, like I was so slow and then even slower watching it on video and like you know, I was playing third base at a division one level like you think that's okay and it's absolutely nothing compared to that level of skill that like infielders possess and then same thing goes for outfielders like that instinct of where to go when the ball is hit off the bat like running a ball down in the gap because that first step or two where you're not really thinking about it you kind of just black out and go um if you're not on that first step or two you're not going to get to that ball that's in the gap or yeah or over your head and actually i have one more this is Another interesting point for like what, how unique and how different each baseball player is. Like you think of a catcher, especially nowadays with like, as they might be going to more of a uh, automated strike zone, receiving is not going to be as important, but arm strength and blocking the ball. And obviously your bat then becomes, you know, skills that you really need to get better at because then you don't have to worry about receiving as much. Our catcher, uh, um, our catcher Ryan Lavarnway, he, I had this was, I thought this was crazy, and you'll appreciate this. During COVID, I think he ran. He's a catcher. He's literally in the big leagues now mm-hmm. <clears throat> with the Indians. Up and down this year, has been up and down for years. I think he won a ring with the Red Sox in 2014. Oh, no, I don't think it was, I forget what year, whatever year they won. He ran an Ironman this off season. He's like a 30 something year old Yale graduate. Major Damn. League Baseball player and he's a catcher ran an Ironman in the offseason. Like, think about the beating that your knees, your back, your ankles take as a catcher, and that's like one of the most like difficult physical things to do as an athlete. Like, I think I think that's insane, and that shows that you know baseball is such a unique sport. So he he was training for it too. So he's spending, I'm assuming at least an hour, a couple hours a day training for an Ironman because if you're a professional athlete and you just jump into an Ironman, that could be the end of your season right there with an injury or maybe tear something. Uh, he, so he, he sounds like he was actively training for it in the off season. Yeah, I, I don't. he told us the stories about it. I don't remember. I don't want to be quoted wrong, but I feel mm-hmm. like he also, there were parts of it that like made, because of baseball, he couldn't fully stay follow the, the the training schedule and parts of it that he just in the moment just crushed and I mean that that's a mm-hmm. gr- insane reflection on his you know athletic ability yeah so I, w- I want to get into that a little bit what what's your take on the idea of dedicating eight to ten hours a day on baseball related skills or for any type of sport you're, you're a professional athlete you're dedicating a majority of your day to either recovery lifting skills and it's a full work day so you might wake up and you know go run in the morning and then you might do skills you, you might go pitch you might hit and then you might do a, a weight way to work out after that you might recover what's your take on basically taking away time from that like if you had to be the best baseball player you had to be the best pitcher you could possibly be 
and you had a cap, someone had a gun to your head and was like, the only, like the, the most you could train in the off season is three hours a day, like two to three hours a day on anything, on throwing, on lifting, on uh, recovery, whatever it is. Do you think that would lead to better performance? Do you think it would lead to worse performance? What What's your take on doing sports like a full-time job? Because I, I see situations where people are doing multiple things and, and they excel at the sport like LeVarn Way where he's dedicating a huge amount of time to the, the, the Ironman and then he's also a major league catcher. Do you think guys like him could be more common or do you think he's an outlier? I think that specific scenario, he might be an outlier. Um, I think also if you're athletic enough and have that skill and you're not just like a one dimensional athlete, like you're not a six foot 11 left-handed pitcher and might be a little bit harder for you to run and bike that kind of distance. Mm. Um, I think if you put your mind to it, you could achieve something like that. I mean, Ironman, we're talking about something that's extremely unique and difficult. Mm. Um, but I do think that there, if, as a professional athlete, most people could do some kind of difficult athletic task like that if they train for it and put their mind to it. And then back mm -hmm. to your question, if you, I think that would be really hard for players if there was a like time constraint that was put on to the, I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of like college though. There's only so much time you can yeah. put in um, unless you want to stay up all hours of the night doing work yeah. or getting extra sport work in. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's why sometimes college sports really constrain your ability to reach your full potential because you have so much on your plate that you can only put so much time in and a lot of sacrifices have to be made. Um, so I don't know what impact that would have. I know if I had a two hour kind of time constraint on me in a day, I'd be absolutely screwed. Like I, not only do I have all the boxes that I need to check on everything that I do on a daily basis, I take my time and I probably talk too much when I'm in my like preparation phase of the, mm -hmm. of the training day. Um, I would have trouble with that, but I think at the end of the day with baseball, what I've learned is, and you've seen like how we trained a lot together in college, um, you and I, mm -hmm. and you've seen how both during those six years, like that style of training changed. And then these three or four years after it, my style has drastically has drastically changed. Um, and obviously like I'm very bought in on the functional movement style of training mm -hmm. that I do, which, you know, you can see the best reflection of it if you follow a place like Cressy sports performance, but obviously mm -hmm. there's sport gyms, more specifically baseball, they're doing that same style all over the place. But what I've learned from coming across different athletes is I thought that was more of an end all be all, unless you're one of these like freak baseball players or you just have that instinct. But, you know, the more guys that you're around, you just realize that everyone's different and everybody needs to do something different for their body to be the best that they can be. And I think the best guys who are those who can have that, uh, like, emotional intelligence of or physical intelligence of, like, what has worked and not worked for them over their careers. And then when they get to a certain level, knowing everything that they need to do and don't really need to do on a daily basis – to be the best that they can be. I'm sure like you've heard rumors of, you know, Mike Trout doesn't really pick up a bat in the off season. He's arguably mm -hmm. one of the, you know, arguably, arguably, arguably going to be the best player of all mm -hmm. time. Um, so I think that everyone I've come, I've, I've taken a step back and instead of thinking that every pitcher needs to do this style, like, no, you need to do what's best for your body. And yes, normally when you see guys who might do something a little bit out of the ordinary, they're freak athletes, they're freak movers, they get into great and sustainable positions, whether it's throwing, pitching, hitting, running, whatever whatever it is. And that's why they're the best because they get into the mm -hmm. most powerful athletic and sustainable positions, um, both on and off the field and no matter what they do. Um, like, you know, people that I, I have, Again, I've had to like train my body so much to move the right way and put myself in better positions. But you look at better athletes and the better movers, like they're normally guys that can like dance well or like look smooth at mm -hmm. whatever they're doing off the field. And those guys are normally the best athletes because they can kind of adapt their bodies 
to those situations. So I really think it's more of the individual. Yeah. Like I, I've been mind blown when I've seen guys who pitchers who still run, you know, poles or run distance after starts as much as that has been proven to maybe be counteractive to the athletic body. It still works for some guys. Like I didn't know this, but I forget who was on our team and they know Max Scherzer and they said Scherzer, Scherzer runs poles. I think it's Scherzer they were talking about. He also trains at Cressy. I mean, a place mm-hmm. that, you know, I think teaches the best baseball body possible. And I was mind blown to hear that. And I've, I, again, I've come across so many different styles that have and have not worked for guys. Yeah. When you're talking about that, it, it makes me think about podcasting a little bit because when I first started podcasting, I would have this super strict routine and, and I definitely still have a podcast routine, but it, it was so listed out and so rigid and I felt like I always had to follow it. I felt like if I was deviating from this routine at all for any specific guest that I wouldn't get the most out of the guest or it'd be a bad conversation or not as many people would listen to it. And so I went from having, you know, maybe thinking about a hundred different things for a podcast when I first started to now simplifying it and having more checkpoints than a, a strict rigid routine. And so my process has been kind kind of like a process of becoming better with less and maximizing the things that you do hang on to. And I never really got to that point in college baseball. I, I, you know, we played for six years together at Richmond. I always was more of the rigid structure routine like no matter what i did i had to do this didn't matter um how i felt that day or whatever i'll take that into account a little bit but i was so in my head with the routine that i never really tried to simplify it and ask myself what was really necessary what can i cut out do you feel like that at baseball with baseball at all where now that you have 10 plus years of playing at the highest level that your process has become a process of simplifying and and maximizing like t- taking away things but doing the things that you do do really well yeah i think over the years i've gotten closer to that um i'm not the best at that like i always get shit on for my pregame or my warm-up routines and how long i take and how i have to do it but one line that i've heard that i think really is that that with me that i've tried to get i've definitely gotten closer to it every year i'm not great at it is like you have to have a routine, but you can't be married to your routine. Um, Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you never know when your name is going to get called. You never know what can happen. And, um, yeah, like I said, I've tried to get closer to that. I'm not the best at that. It's funny you say that. Um, I was talking to Emily about this, I remember, recently. And I was like, you know what? Like with the next rehab process, if I decide to go ahead and pursue baseball after another um, arm surgery, like I need to have the mindset that like, if something happens, if shit happens, if life happens, I can't let my day get be ruined or be upset because I'm, I'm, I missed a part of baseball today. Like that stuff happens. And if you hold yourself to higher standards and know what your capabilities are, like you're still going to be prepared to do what you need to a day or two days later. And you can't let that affect you mentally as much as I have allowed that to affect me mentally in the past well obviously you don't let those days um pile up um i i have tried to move towards that and i think one thing like you know more specifically for a relief pitcher the first time you get called in where you're cold and you're sitting you're sitting on your ass on the bench having a conversation in the bullpen with the guy next to you and your name is called and you have to be hot in a hitter or two it really forces you to move a little bit closer towards that mindset and know like okay everything that i've done in my life has prepared me for this opportunity that's in front of me right now. And no matter what, I have to trust that I'm ready to do it. So that is actually something I want to try to move towards, um, you know, with my training and my, and my rehab in the future. Yeah. I think that's a good mindset that that's something it's funny because I I think about all the ways that I think about uh, podcasting now. And I wish that I would have applied more, things that I think about podcasting to when I was playing baseball because there is a creativity aspect to baseball and such a big mental aspect to baseball and 
when I'm preparing for a podcast, that is my routine time. And then when I'm doing a podcast like now, I, I have some notes in front of me. I did all the, the preparation. There's not as much research because obviously we know each other so well that we can talk to each other for three hours and talk about any random topic. But what I never got good at in baseball is letting the performance be a celebration and letting the performance be an exciting thing that you're trying to be as present and in the moment as possible and really having fun. I always felt like I took my routine too much into the actual performance and the actual game. And what I wish I would have done is acknowledge the fact that I've prepared as much as possible. I did all the mobility. I did my throwing routine that week. I got in my lifting. And then now whatever happens, let's just have this be fun as fuck, go out there, do a good job, and obviously perform and make this an exciting experience. Like, don't be trying to fix your motion during a game, which I, which I would do so many times. I'd be like, oh, this isn't, you know, how I was stepping in the gym. I'd be like, who gives a fuck? Like, th- maybe your body is extra tight today, your hips, so you're stepping over here, or maybe, you know, this mound is shaped differently. I wish I kind of let go more during the games. It's so, it's, I am the same way. It's so hard to, when you've been that way for so long, it's so hard for that to change. But I think that's also why we love to compete so much and why we get so much, mm-hmm. um, like satisfaction and joy when you do accomplish whatever you're trying to accomplish or when you do win. But I'm the exact same way. And that's something that's really, really difficult to get away from. And the best guys, by far are the guys who are the loosest and have the short and have short term memory, um, both on and off the field. Like the guys who can go back to the clubhouse and immediately shake off the bad outing after the game, carry on with everyday life for the rest of the night. And then, you know, the next day is a new day and you either got to be ready to go again the next day or prepare for whenever your next opportunity is like nothing bad happened in your last, in your last opportunity. And I think that's one thing that really separates the highest level of athletes, more specifically in this case, you know, big league baseball players who stick, stick in the big leagues. Uh, Yeah. I've, I've so many memories of this artificially constructed anger that I would have after a bad performance where say, I say I went out for a start on Friday and I lasted two innings, gave up six runs, gave up, you know, three bombs and did not do my job at all. I'm obviously angry at myself and I'm going to be pissed. And I would feel like I almost artificially constructed this angry persona for a few days or maybe even up to a week because I felt like I had to show other people that I was also pissed off and that if my teammates, if my teammates or coaches saw me having fun during practice or went out later that night, that it would somehow mean that I didn't care as much about baseball. And now looking back on it, I realize how counterproductive that is because once you're done playing the game, the only thing that matters is thinking about what you could have done better and then applying that through drill work or through recovery, working out, whatever it is. It's honing those skills and learning from the experience and thinking about what you could have done better and being angry and making yourself feel angry so that you can show that anger to others is only going to make that process take longer. What what would actually be better is if you could, you know, you have that five minutes of anger, maybe you fucking go pack a dip and uh, I don't know, jerk off behind the, the, (laughs) the wall in the outfield or punch a wall through it and, uh, whatever your thing is, and then 10 minutes later, you're just like, all right, fuck it. Uh, there's still a game going on. I have another week until I pitch again. Holding on to this anger is literally doing zero for me. It's probably actually making me a worse baseball player. And I do agree that the best guys that we've been around have had that looseness about them because it not only makes you a better player, but it also gives other people permission to be loose. I feel like that's one of the best things you could do as a leader on a baseball team. And what I liked about the seniors when we were freshmen, guys like uh, Chris and and, and Conway and Brett, was that they were 
all really good at baseball and they also had this loose vibe to their class that I feel like we kind of lost a little bit after they graduated, but them being loose gave other people permission to not take themselves so seriously and have fun when the game is over and realize that this is this is a game and it's important, but there are also other things that are important to do when you're trying to enjoy your life. That's so, so true. I, I will say that I've never heard it said that way. And that was so perfectly explained the uh, artificially constructed anger um, for post outings. I don't think you see that as much in other sports. There's times where it's like, yes, you can be angry. You can show emotion. You can, slam something or throw something because you're at such a high level of being upset with yourself and everything that's going on around you. But I think that really starts from a the youth age because for some reason, <clears throat> I don't know what it is, I feel like baseball parents, more specifically baseball dads, are so strict on kids at a young age. And mm-hmm. I don't know, I maybe that's because baseball is a sport that so many people play at a younger age and then kind of fizzle out <clears throat> or or burn out of at some point but i think that's something that starts at a young age where like you just put this high level of pressure on yourself and then for people that want to play at the professional level as you get older everything that you do matters a little bit more in terms of playing at that level and then you put this like you get so upset when you fail after all the time that you prepare that you think it's like the end of the world i remember in college you know after getting shelled or walking the house thinking like, all right, you know, there was a scout or two there today. I'm, I'm never playing again after college. And like, that's such a bad mindset. I mean, and like my roundabout way to the things that I've been able to take part in in baseball and accomplish is shows that like, it really doesn't matter. Um, but you, as you kind of play higher levels, and for me, it was more higher levels of independent ball you see people carry that anger with them less and less every day. And there's been times where like I've shut down after outings because I'm so upset with my performance and like people are so supportive and like try to show you that like you need to move on. Like you have to move on from this because you have to be able to perform the next day or the day after. And like, so again, that's what the best players are able to do. They're able to move on and turn the page and just like, you know, go about their normal life after that. I, yeah. I remember an outing in like three years ago. It was horrible. Like there was, I was an independent ball. Um, there was a few scouts that were supposed to come there to see me. Um, I came in in a, a game where we were up by like seven runs or something mm-hmm. like that. And um, I was like, I think I was closing at the time. So it wasn't a normal situation to come in, but I was coming in to throw mm-hmm. in front of some guys. And I gave up like six runs in a third of an inning. Just like nothing went my way. Like was throwing yeah, hard, baby. But just missing. Yeah, one of those outings. And I literally just shut down. Like from the second I came out, yeah. so right before we were about to hop on the bus to complete our or to go on the next stop of our road trip, I didn't say a word. And our manager like called me into the office. He was like, well, he's like, first of all, you're going to take a shot of this. And I was like, literally had like, I forget what it was, like some kind of, some kind of whiskey and he's like second of all the guys that were supposed to come see you today they weren't able to make it like don't worry about it you're fine you know we're gonna give you a day off and you're gonna be right back out there the next day um and like i think you know the more people you have that support you and show you that that is the mindset to have um the easier it is to have that short-term memory and be ready for the next opportunity that you're given and not have and, and not let that anger um you know compile so what speaking of shots this is a question that just popped into my head what is the most what is the most amount of shots let's say whiskey what's the the highest number of shots you think you could take for a relief appearance one inning you just had to to shut it down you had to go out there Give a hell of an inning, no runs, you hold it there. What What's the highest number of shots you think you could take and still oh get God. that done? Like if you had to push the limit, if you got if you got a monetary bonus, $10,000 for the more shots you took, each shot you got 10 grand, but if you gave up a run, you wouldn't get any of the money. What's the number that you would pick to go out there? Oh boy. 
Well, I think with me, I go out there and I, I like to like keep eating while I'm in the bullpen to not have a fully empty stomach, but I'm like close mm-hmm. to being empty. So I don't feel bloated mm-hmm. and slow on the mound. And then when your stomach's more empty, it hits you a little bit harder. So for me, it would probably only be like a, you know, two shot, three shot level. But I think the perfect opportunity for that would be like, you know, freezing cold game. You can't get your blood pumping would be like rip a shot of disgusting whiskey. That's just going to, you know, prick every single hair on your arm and your body upright and wake everything up and just get the blood pumping. I think there in time or there's times where that could be, you know, beneficial. I so this is this would be my approach. I would do ten, but this is how I would do it. I, I I would go in on a full stomach. I would have a handle with ten shots left in it, and right as like literally right after I threw the last warm up pitch before the inning would start, I would pull the handle to the face. I, I would rip ten shots, and I and I would pitch to contact to try to get the inning over as quickly as possible. So hopefully I have a 10 pitch inning, 10 to 15 pitch inning. I don't want strikeouts. I just need to get through the inning without giving up a run. And then as soon as I walk into the dugout, I can just start puking or vomiting or <laughs> raving. And hopefully it would take at least cause it, cause it takes, I would say if you rip 10 shots, you start to feel a little bit drunk right away, but then it takes 10 to 15 minutes for you to be like, to absolutely lose your world. So I would I would rip ten, the final warm up pitch, and then pitch to contact, get the hundred grand, and then I could do whatever I wanted after. I could continue, I could vomit, I could, uh, you know, rip uh, shots with the coaches, like whatever whatever you wanted to do. I think your boy Eric Sim would be the perfect case study for this. That that's that's something that Eric Sim should make a video about and, and for people that are listening that aren't aware of eric sim i actually had him on the podcast uh probably two years ago at this point and he he went to juco he went to junior college played six years of pro ball as a catcher and a pitcher and he now works for a media company called momentum that is associated with trevor bauer and he does these crazy videos with other softball players baseball players athletes from different sports and sometimes alcohol is involved. He he loves ripping shots and hitting the ball 154 miles an hour off a tee. I feel like for him, a good video would be how many shots can I take to uh, to throw a scoreless inning? And you, you start yeah. at one and you keep going up. Or you do how many shots can I take and still hit 90 miles an hour? So you, t- you t- rip a shot, you hit 92, rip another shot. And basically, till you go below 90, you can't stop ripping shots. Oh my god! You should do it with him. I would be down. I would have to change it for seventy. I would have to change the bar to seventy miles an hour. <laughs> when can I drop below seventy? Um, so something I wanted to get back into to shift gears back to the Olympics. I wanted to ask you, what is it like actually playing on the Olympic stage? So you you go through the Olympic ceremony. You've you're there with your team, you're set up, you've seen the Olympic village now for the actual competition aspect. What was it like playing in the Olympic games and actually going out in the field and pitching in Tokyo, uh, 2021, the, the COVID Olympics as people will probably look back on it. What was that like pitching and being on the field, representing an entire country team Israel and competing against people from all around the world? Yeah, I mean, I think it that, you, you know, building up to it, you knew that there was going to be no fans. Like, you knew that most likely there would not be any spectators there. Like, the adrenaline would have to come from within, just from the stage that you are playing on. Um, I think it really hit me for the first time, not even like you asked before, not really entering the village. Um, I wouldn't say that was when it hit me. I would say that the opening ceremonies, and we had, like, a three-hour buildup. Like, you're waiting in the tunnel, waiting for the ceremonies to start. You know everything's happening on TV. And then as you march in, although there was, you know, maybe a 1,000 people in the stands at the ceremonies, and it was just staff, um, just, like, all, of like, the theatrics of everything and the performances and, like, the people kind of go, like, 
performing and dancing around you as you walked in and then you like walk through the tunnel and like all the bright lights are on you that was when it hit me um and you know walking through the opening ceremonies like you could see there were tv cameras everywhere tv cameras floating overhead and when i was holding my phone up and like kind of videoing the surrounding area while i was like looking around in my hand like i could feel my phone just vibrating and i was like all right people are this hasn't happened since i've been here so people are obviously seeing us yeah. walking through or maybe more specifically seeing me on tv and um that was an incredible feeling like that was and that's that the, that's the opening ceremony right yeah the opening ceremonies um and that felt like walking that felt like running in from the bullpen to like close out of close ball game time you know times so many levels um so that was neat and then um it took a while for that rush to kind of go down like we stayed there and watched for like another two plus hours other countries walking in and it was still like, holy mm-hmm. crap, like everybody in the world can see me right now. And then we had like a nice like five day build up to our first game. So we were able to practice in Japan and kind of uh, uh, do like live outings there before um, before our first game. So for me, the I didn't pitch in the first game, but my first outing was against Team USA. And although it didn't really go the way I had hoped, coming in from that game, you know, I was in the bullpen for most every game. I wasn't really in the dugout, wasn't able to kind of celebrate with everybody mm-hmm. when we would score and whatnot. But when I actually had my first time running in out of the pen and like, you know, there's a camera following you on that, on that little Toyota car we had to take in. Mm-hmm. There was cameras all like in the little tunnels under around the dugout cameras in the stand, like mm-hmm. seeing those, like feeling those bright, lights and those bright like high level stadium lights on you immediately was immediately it was like this is nothing i have ever done in my life before mm-hmm. and like all eyes are on me and it was just like straight adrenaline and excitement to be out there and again like i said although that first outing didn't go the way i had liked um once i was completed and like kind of caught my breath in the dugout it was like this is it's like this is incredible. Like, this is absolutely incredible that I am here right now. And I had definitely had like a little bit of like a reflection moment, like sitting there in the dugout after that outing. And it was like, wow, like I officially pitched an Olympic game. And I think that the, the, that level came down maybe a little bit in that second outing in terms of like the extra beating of your heart, but it was still that same level of um, intensity that you had going out and taking the field for that. So it was, it was amazing. And I mean, it led to a lot of like self and personal reflection for me and everything that it took to get to this opportunity and like kind of the, the um, ups and downs of my career and everything to get there. So, yeah, I mean, it was, it was incredible. And then you kind of go back to the village and you see all these athletes who have trained their whole life, life for this opportunity and made you feel, um, uh, made, made me feel like very accomplished, I guess. Yeah, it, it was wild as your friend watching you on my laptop coming out to pitch in the Olympics and you, you came out on that mitt, the baseball glove car. That must have been wild going out into the field. I've never seen anyone be brought out onto a sports field using a tool that is used in the game so you were yeah. using a baseball glove in the game and they brought you out on a glove car it, it would be like if a basketball player came out onto the court in a mini ba- in a, like a human-sized basketball hamster wheel where they brought like a shoe all the starters out yeah exactly or they were riding in a shoe uh something like that that must have been a wild experience coming out to the field for the first time in that baseball glove car yeah. and, and even though there weren't fans there, there's still the cameras and the lights and everything you were talking about. Yeah, it was cool. It was like a historic thing almost because you've never seen that done before. And like, I had like a picture of me in it that went like, that went viral. And like, that was, I I was lucky that I had a really cool, like really sick image um, captured of me in that moment. Um, Personally, I would never want to do that. I love running in from the bullpen. Like I love the rush that you get. I like also, feeling like I'm staying loose from bullpen to running out to the mound. And I like that little extra, like, all right, my blood's pumping more. I catch my breath a little bit when I get on the mound. Like 
I'm ready to go. So that was, it was almost like anticlimactic in a way, like having mm-hmm. to then, all right, I'm hot. And then I go yeah. sit in the cart. This thing goes out. And it was funny because I guess it was like completely electric because there was no, you didn't hear the gas. It was just dead silent as you would roll out and the doors would open. Um, and then like the bright lights were on you. Um, so it was, it was cool to be a part of that, but I would, and the cart, the cart was sick. Like I have some funny pictures like in the cart. Um, before the game, like, again, it was a really sick concept, but I would rather run out there and have my adrenaline continue to, to spike. But in this specific, um, uh, uh, circumstance, if you ran out of the bullpen, your time clock would start as soon as you came out of the bullpen. If you took Mm -hmm. the car out, your clock would not start until you get out of the car when you're almost on the mound already. So it saves you like, you know, three to six pitches on the mound depending on how quickly you warm up. So it would not have been a good idea to run in. Yeah, it did, it did seem like it took a long time for the mitt to get from the bullpen to the mound. If, if they made a hypercharged turbo mitt, or maybe you came out on a mitt motorcycle, something like that, where it would keep the adrenaline from the bullpen into the real game, I I think that would add some spice to baseball if instead of just the walkout, you'd have something where each player had their own unique thing that they came out with. Maybe not all the pitchers, but the starting pitcher where they they ran out and and they already have their song, but it was like they came out in a a Porsche or or Harley Davidson (laughs) or they brought cheerleaders out. Like they had their own cheerleader squad on the sidelines as they're warming up. Something to add to the fan experience of baseball that other sports already do like the UFC where they wear the flags and they yeah. walk out and, and they have their song and everyone's cheering or, or cheerleaders with the NFL on the sidelines, something like that, that doesn't take away from the performance aspect of baseball, but adds to the fan experience. Yeah. I mean, I think the hard thing with baseball is it's such a tradition, traditional sport. And that's why you get so much pushback when there's changes that happen. But at the end of the day, like the world changes every day, society changes, people change, and like, you know, change is going to happen to help keep fans engaged. I think I personally would take a, like a bird scooter, or a lime scooter out to the mound. I think that'd be sick. Just like have your glove on your head or something like that, or have the glove hanging off the front of the scooter and take the electric scooter out, like pop a little wheelie and toss it to the side and then get going. Exactly. And then, and then you keep it behind you on the mound in case you ever have a ground ball where you have to cover first you could field it and then hop on the scooter and then you just run it you run across the bag it's like well imagine you on a bird scooter staring down uh uh, like billy hamilton as he's sprinting to first and you're like eye to eye with him on a bird scooter and you get there just in time and then you do like the whip around with the scooter, you flip it, and then that's the that's the play. Yes, I would. That'd be that'd be insane. I'd be so down. I don't think I'm athletic enough to pull that off, but I'm down to practice. So, th- this is something that I've been thinking about with baseball because we're talking about the fan experience, and it makes me think about other sports that I've been into recently, like UFC, and something that the UFC does really well that other sports don't do as much is they play up the storylines of the opponents. So there'll be the McGregor versus Poirier and they talk shit to each other in press conferences and there's this whole build up and they go back and forth on social media and they create these storylines. It's it's not just a fight. It's the story. And it seems like that's what makes a lot more people tune into the UFC is that they're not just watching two skilled fighters. There are fighters all over the world that are super skilled that no one watches because there's no story there. I think the UFC does a great job of building up the storylines between two people so that the fans are actually invested in a side. They pick a side. Mm -hmm. So to you, I'll ask, do you think major league baseball or even at the, you could do it at the Olympic level as well. Do you think, MLB should pick, let's say, five or six matchups every year for each team because you can't do it with 162 games. That that would be ridiculous. Mm-hmm. But just have five solid games where 
you pick the best player from each team and they're just talking shit to each other. And this starts months before you maybe in April when the season first starts, you have Aaron Judge and Mike Trout. They just start going back and forth with each other on social media for a game that's happening in July. And then they'll hold a, a press conference where they're actually sitting, talking shit to each other, going back and forth. And then you have those matchups a few times for each team throughout the year so that there's not just the skill aspect of baseball, but there's also kind of this fan investment in the storylines. And you could even make it fun for the players where maybe Mike Trout puts out a fucking music video, two chains or something talking shit about the Yankees. (laughs) And then uh, Aaron judge comes back and he does like a dance routine and all this shit where you have extra things added into the fan experience. Do you, th- do you think the MLB should build up the storylines more and build up the rivalries like UFC? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's an extreme example that it obviously would gain a certain type of crowd's attention. But um, I don't see something like to that level happening in you know, more traditional sport like baseball. Um, definitely, like I said, would get some people's attention. I think that uh, if you remember earlier this year, one of the biggest headlines from this season was with all of like the foreign substance, like sticky stuff for pitchers. And when Josh mm-hmm. Donaldson called out, uh, called out Garrett Cole and was like, um, you know, talking about him and had all this stuff to say, those matchups were highly like viewed when the um when 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 they faced off and i remember making sure that i was home so i could tune in for that first uh for that first matchup and as a pitcher i was like screw donaldson like hope cole shoves it up his ass and like you know he sure enough has since sticky stuff or not and he's having another incredible season um but yeah i mean i do think that there are I, i don't i don't think i'm creative enough to really know or offer up any ideas as to what could improve fan engagement i mean i really like how they do all these special games like they did the um the game in iowa a few weeks ago they do the mm-hmm. game in williams in williamsport like with the players interacting with youth players like at the little league world series um the international games like trying to bring light to baseball i think they did it in france or somewhere in the past mm-hmm. trying to bring light to baseball in europe i personally um I personally like that stuff a lot. Um, I think if I think that they could do something to, um, they, they, again, baseball is a traditional sport. I don't want all the rules to be changed to an extent where it really changes the game. But there, I, I would think that there are ways that would improve fan engagement. Like in minor league baseball, people like to go out for all the theatrics that happen in between innings and like the competitions where they bring fans out in the field. Like why can't that happen? at a big league level. And one thing that I, an experience that I had that I thought was so cool was when we played one of the qualifiers was in Germany and we played against Germany in the night, in the, like the evening game. So there was a bunch of like fans from Germany there. And this I think should definitely happen in baseball because you have so many of those quiet lulls, like different points in the game where it just seems to kind of drag on for fans. What they would do is, it only did it when Germany was hitting, but I think it should be done for both sides. The walk up, the walkout song would play for the hitters. They get to the plate. They would pause the song. And they would pause the song like after the pitcher takes the sign and comes set. Pitch is thrown. As soon as like ball or strike is called or if the ball's put in play and the play ends, like song repeats. So I guess better example would be like, mm-hmm. all right, I throw ball one. And then the song, as soon as ball is called, the song picks the walk up that song picks up ball thrown back to the pitcher guy uh, walks around the mound comes set again song is cut and then the song is continued so it's almost like yeah. you have music going into the game i know i love that i thought that was so cool as a mm-hmm. pitcher like i got to throw two innings in that game and like like music you know would come on while you're like taking your sign mm-hmm. it would kind of fire you up a little bit and from a fan engagement standpoint like i think something like that would be sick it makes it almost more of like a um like upbeat like party atmosphere to keep people engaged like Mm -hmm. music is like i think the best way to you know unite people and bring people together so i think for fan engagement like something like that would be so cool that wouldn't really take away from what's going on in the field yeah there there should be 
a creative director for every baseball team that is in charge of storylines and just thinking of ways to make this game or this series more interesting for the most exciting uh for the most exciting series throughout the year because the players are obviously focused on you you have to play well you have to compete and you could work with someone like a creative director for a team but you also have to dedicate most of your time to the actual skills of getting better at baseball and you yeah. have guys like trevor bauer that have signed huge contracts they're good at using cameras themselves but they also have people that are helping them out on the creative end with ideas and things with videos and storylines i think if right now let's say for example the yankees got a creative director and for every single series throughout the year someone's job was just to make the game more interesting for fans without taking away from the performance with small things like in the ufc where after a fight happens you have that moment where Bruce Buffer comes out with a microphone and it's this guy with a super triumphant voice and he announces the the winner and the loser of the fight and he raises the fist of the winner and the loser has to stand there and they either clap or they their heads down, something like that. If you had something like that, where is this super almost... Uh, like climax of the game more than shaking hands where if someone came out and announced you know uh after nine innings uh six home runs 10 strikeouts after three hours and 47 minutes your winners of today's game is the new york yankees and then all the yankees just like <laughs> raised their fists and started going fucking crazy all the guys on the field and then the other team would also have to be there too rather than just having the shaking hands because shaking hands is kind of boring like for the fans you're just yeah it's almost like uh like a floppy boner you're just watching guys wave their fists <laughs> at each other passing if you had small things like that that wouldn't take away from the skill aspect but were just simple ways to spice it up i think having a creative director in baseball someone that would create storylines where there were none and even amp up existing storylines between the players and between the teams and, and tradition and shit like that. I think that would bring baseball to the level that college football is and, and what UFC is starting to become and, and even have more of an international presence like soccer or so, something like that. And, and mm -hmm. baseball has, you know, millions of fans all around the world watching, but I do think the tradition holds back the fan experience a little bit. Yeah, I, I I agree. I mean, it's yeah, you're obviously seeing that happen in the game today, where fans are losing interest, or people can't stay past five or six innings. So I I completely agree. And again, I I've never thought about this, and this is why I say this again. I think I go back to like why in minor league baseball, when you go from there to the big leagues, is all of the in between innings theatrics stop. Like, or another thing, if you have the players who are a little bit more fan engaging, more outgoing, a little bit more, a little bit funnier, have bigger personalities, why not do like in between inning interviews with them on the field where, you know, it's a 30 second back and forth, but they have, you know, time in the field or time in the dugout where they can think about what they want to say or what they want to do or how they want to be involved. Um, like in between innings to kind of keep the fans engaged. I don't mm -hmm. think all players would would be able or willing to do that, but there's players on every single team who would love that opportunity to kind of do a little bit more than just what they do on the field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Derek Jeter, the man, just got officially inducted into Cooperstown yesterday because COVID delayed the ceremonial induction last year, I think it was supposed to be last summer. And so he was just officially put into Cooperstown. And I wanted to ask you, you're a Yankees fan. What is your, and, and even even if you're a Mets fan, you have memories of Derek Jeter. I'm a Mets fan, grew up a Mets fan, still a Mets fan. I have a ton of memories watching Derek Jeter play against the Mets or just watching them on TV, on Yes Network. For you, what is your favorite memory of watching Derek Jeter play growing up what comes to mind when you think about Derek Jeter now looking back on all the moments of you having seen him play yeah I mean, I think it's a reflection of how old we're getting to you know like oh this is our child like again 
like when Jeter retired, I remember thinking like, this is our childhood, like ending right here. Like he was the face of the Yankees mm-hmm. throughout my whole youth. And, um, you know, he's, he's now done playing. So it definitely reflects our age. Um, and like, you know, he played for a long time. So there's so many memories that you have of him. And I think before I say those, the what sticks out the most to me with someone like Jeter and growing up a Yankees fan and seeing him play so much is like the way that he just led by example and kind of kept his head down, went about his business and like tried to stay out of the spotlight and just do what he needed to every day and just like carry himself in the most respectful way possible and leading by example like that's something that I always loved and respected about him and you know I've I'm a much quieter person in those um uh in those settings and when I've been in leadership positions on the baseball field that's exactly how I try to you know lead the group of guys that I'm playing with um so I really love and respect that about him more than anybody else and I think that's why he's such a you know, such a well-respected and well-known person in face of baseball. Um, my favorite memories, I think, from when we were younger, I'd say are the flip where he came in uh, against the A's and, like, the ALDS. I forget what year it was, maybe 02, might have even been before. I think 02. I don't know. I, no, it might have been. I don't remember what year it was where he came in from short step, from short on the ball that was in the corner in right field, and he came, like, past the mound. Uh, ball was thrown in from the outfield, got by the cutoff man, like he picked it up and like backhand flipped to, I think Posada or Girardi was catching and te- they tagged like Jeremy Giambi on the leg and it was like, you know, very close call that was hard to see, but it looked like he tagged him on the back of the leg. Like that, that play was just insane and um, obviously it was game changing in, in, in that series and also the home run. I know the Yankees lost this World Series, the one they lost to the Diamondbacks. But the walk-off home run he hit in the corner of right field at Yankee Stadium off of Young Hum Kim, um, yeah. that those were two memories of our um, and then all the jump turn throws, of course, that you see on like the Jordan Jeter logos today um, in the in the six hole. Those are more memories mm-hmm. from our, our youth. And then as we got older, I think these I guess these were both when we were in college. I remember watching his. 3,000th hit the home run off David Price was just like like you now this man's career is just incredible like your 3,000th hit to hit is a home run mm-hmm. um, and then his last home game at Yankee Stadium he had the walk off single to right field against the Orioles mm-hmm. I think those are some of my favorite um, Jeter memories but again when I think of him like it's kind of what I talked about before and the way that he carried himself on and off the field like I have so much respect for that and. Um, you know, I think he's it's why he's still in the game today. Yeah, he's he's such a unique guy because he not only was one of the greatest players ever to live in the game of baseball, but he took on the spirit of an entire city, New York City, which is one of the biggest cities in the world, one of the most thought about cities in the world. It's a, one of the centers of global pop culture trade shit's going on and it makes me think about what a player has to do to not only be really good and make millions of dollars for a team because there there are always those players that sign those massive contracts and that are really good but they don't take on the spirit of a city for you what what do you think it was about Derek Jeter where he just became the guy in New York. Like when people thought about New York, they would think about Derek Jeter. Sometimes even before the Yankees, like some people would say, you know, this is this was his city, or this was he, he was somehow this this figure, and that doesn't really happen a lot in sports. It it happens once in a generation with certain cities, but he was definitely a guy where he was just the man for New York. I have, that's a good question. I have no idea how I have no idea how that started, but again, I think it comes to the, the the level of professionalism that he has and why he was able to gain so much respect from so many people so quickly and then the ability also, you know, when you're yeah, when you're present when you're present every day, like you know, when you're healthy especially like he was earlier on in his career playing, you know, pretty much every inning of every game, you're like 
you know, people see you every single day, people remember your face and they then when you carry yourself and then have the success that someone like him had, people are going to like you more and more and more. Not to mention that, like, I think every single girl in, in elementary school growing up owned like a Derek Jeter t-shirt because every single, everyone yeah. loved him um, and was attracted to him. Um, and it was something about his personality, I think, that just drew people in. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing that we were, you know, and as a Yankee fan, there were multiple people that also could have had that role on that team. But for whatever reason, even though Jeter wasn't always the three hitter, was not always the best hitter on the team, um, you know, he he was that person for us um, as New Yorkers growing up. And um, I, I don't I don't really know why. I don't know how that happened. I think we were too young to really remember. But it would be interesting to know, like, how did this – I mean – I think he was a first rounder, um, but like, how did this man just come into the spotlight so quickly? I know he debuted at a really young age, so that's mm-hmm. also part. Think about like guys in other cities, like um, who come up at such a young age and leave such a strong impact on the organization. Like you expect that person to be your franchise player, whether or not they live up to like Hall of Fame status. When you are expected to be that person and then you put together a 20 year major league season where you're this everyday starter at shortstop, you're going to gain an extra level of love and respect from everyone in that city. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wish that he wasn't involved in baseball anymore because I want to hear him go on a two, three hour podcast like Joe Rogan and tell everything about his baseball career, the girls, the partying, players he was obviously playing during the steroid era too where there are a lot of questions and Mm. and people have a lot of curiosity about Derek Jeter and as long as he's part of a major league organization he has to be a symbol of professionalism so I'm definitely looking forward to if he chooses to go on some sort of tell-all interview or write a book that's not this foo-foo idealized version of his career but something that actually gets into it and one thing that I want to hear him address for sure is that rumor that he would give girls gift baskets as a parting present because that's an absolute savage move. Like having a having a one night stand with someone, you're they're in your luxury New York apartment, and on the way out, you say, "Oh, by the way, I I can't show you out, but but here's this this Kindle and gift card to Starbucks." And also, you know, there's some some tanning, there's tanning oil, some some bath bombs, some lotions. You can't be angry at a guy like that. If I had a one night stand with someone and on the way out, they're like, hey, you know, this isn't going to be anything serious. But also, here's this gift basket of, of lotions and uh, some supplements and, and things like that. I'd be like, all right, well, this was a great experience. Hey, just another reason why everybody loves Jeter. Yeah, yeah. So, so something I wanted to ask you, because this is probably one of the most debated things in the sport of baseball, and you would have a good opinion on this because you've actually been playing for a long time as a professional. What is your opinion on Barry Bonds being in the Hall of Fame? Do you do you think that players who excelled like Barry Bonds, who arguably may be the greatest player of all time and played in an era before Major League Baseball started testing, I think it was 2003, they started testing for steroids. What is your take on Barry Bonds being in the Hall of Fame? Do you think he should be in? Do you think that it doesn't matter that he took steroids before the MLB started testing it? Do you think you have to separate it? Or do you think you just take all the players from that era and say, fuck it, it was part of the game. Whoever was good during that era, we should just give a blanket across and say, we're just going to look at their skills and their numbers and not make your not make steroids a part of it. What's your take on Barry Bonds uh, getting into the Hall of Fame? Yeah, I absolutely should be in. I mean, no doubt in my mind, like taking a, a steroid does not make you a better baseball player. Like, yeah, it might allow you to might allow you to uh, stay healthier for longer and kind of push your body to limit a little bit more. Um, But I think all of those guys should be in Um, there. It's so hard because there's such a gray area there of the timing that that all happened. And I don't know what the exact rules were at the time, but I think that all of those guys from the pre steroid testing era should be in with, 
you know, put an asterisk next to them in the Hall of Fame. Don't put them in their own separate section because then it's not going to look like it's truly a part of the Hall of Fame. Like, put them in in the time period where they belong. And, um, you know, if you need to have an asterisk next to them, put an asterisk next to them. But I think they deserve it for the amount of time so, that, and fan engagement and awareness that they brought to the sport. There was so much excitement during the Barry Bonds, Sammy Sosa, and Mark McGuire time. Like, those guys did a lot for baseball, and I think they do deserve to be in. Um, and there's no, like, and then make a ruling that says if you fail a drug test or if you knowingly took performance-enhancing drugs from here on out, you will not be allowed in the Hall of Fame. If you adopt that rule, then you can stick by it. But there's just, I think there's just too much gray period. And it's, uh, and same thing goes for someone like Pete Rose. Like he should not be banned from baseball, like for, for betting on baseball. I think that's just absolutely ridiculous. There's probably yeah. more people out there that have done that than, um, than we know who are still involved with the sport. Like I, I just think it's absolutely ridiculous that guys like that are uh, prevented from, you know, being recognized for what they've done for the sport and what they've accomplished. So uh, I agree that Barry Bonds and Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. Let let me push back a little bit because you said you don't think steroids make you a better baseball player. Say that one more time. You don't think steroids make you a better baseball player? I mean, they can, but do they direct you? If you take steroids and sit on your ass, are you going to be a better baseball player? No. You obviously have to train and still do yeah. the right things to prepare yourself. So, like, yeah, from a pitcher's standpoint, I'm sure that it helps expedite recovery, allows you to get more out of your body in the weight room, and allows you to kind of maybe exert more force and energy. So, yes, they can make you a better baseball player, but if you're not testing for that, if you're not outlawing that, how can you prevent someone from being recognized yeah. for accomplishing it, what they have? So, they can make yeah. you a better baseball player, I'm sure. I I think it I think it does for sure make you it, it makes you it kind of turns the dial up it amplifies your skills so if you're an average baseball player that is putting the work in and you start taking a regimen of steroids or HGH or testosterone those you know say say you hit ten home runs and then you flew out to the wall twenty times those. 20 flyouts would then turn into 20 home runs and then maybe your you, with your strength getting better your your speed getting better i think it amplifies the skills that you already have so steroids from what i've seen at least definitely make a difference with that being said i do agree that it won't just make you a better athlete out of nowhere. It may make you bigger and stronger and you have to recover, but you also have to put in the skill work to take the quote unquote gifts that steroids give you and be able to apply them in a sport specific way. So someone like Barry Bonds, I think even with the steroids, he was still probably outworking almost every single guy in Major League Baseball. It's the steroids that just turned him in a, into a genetic freak and a different kind of player than he would have been had he not taken performance-enhancing drugs. He came in, he, he turned himself into a home run factory rather than someone who may have hit, you know, three, four hundred home runs, but been an absolute threat on the base pass or more of a quicker fast switch player yeah i i i completely agree i mean we don't we don't fully know i don't know if there's like case studies involving that more specifically in baseball there's obviously a reason why performance enhancing drugs are banned from sports um but again such a gray period and um hey maybe that's a maybe that's the fan engagement thing for you there have a separate league where you can juice and uh they allow they allow that and see uh, see see what happens. <laughs> oh my God, dude! I, Jose Canseco would be the commissioner of that league in Mexico. He would, he would start <laughs> it in Mexico, where all that shit's legal, and he would say, "Hey, listen, we're gonna create this baseball league where you can take anything you want. You can inject during the game. You can do it live. You can, you know." We'll uh, we'll even sell some roids for fans who want to get in on the action. Maybe we'll even have a competition where we give steroids to a fan throughout the course of a season, and then we'll see how good they get, kind of like this live experiment, because you could do anything down in Mexico. I, 
if if an idea like that started, Jose Canseco would definitely be the commissioner behind it, and that would definitely get people to watch. And then the winner of that league plays the winner of Major League Baseball with the restrictions, and then you have this kind of Space Jam Monstars matchup where you have <laughs> all these guys that are you know six foot six, two hundred eighty pounds shredded took 40 years off their life so they're absolute specimens but they're about to die in five years against these other guys who are highly skilled baseball players in the mlb but they're clean and you put them together and you see what happens that would be sick i'd be and they make a space jam baseball version i'd love that yeah i'm in so me too so a a couple things i wanted to ask you as we end off one one is a a skill related question and the last one is a more life question. So for you, if you could steal any pitch from a pitcher that is alive today that has is either still pitching or has pitched during our lifetime. So if you could steal a pitch from any pitcher that is alive today, but you had to fight them to get it. So, for example, if you wanted to steal, if you wanted to steal Araldis Chapman's fastball, you would have to fight Araldis Chapman and win in a basically a UFC match against Araldis Chapman oh to steal God. his fastball. And then, and then part of your repertoire would be you could throw 105 miles an hour from the left side. Who would you oh pick God. to fight? So, so you have to. You, you have to beat them in a fight. You don't have to fight to the death, but you have to beat them in a fight, and then you absorb their best pitch. Who would you pick? Well, um, definitely not Chapman. Uh, I don't know if you've seen his off-season workouts. Um, his biceps if, if, are the size of this punching bag I have right here. They literally look like he has punching bags for biceps. Huge. Um realistically to have a chance against someone i'd have to say chris sales fastball uh probably weighs 100 weighs less maybe weighs the same as you soaking wet so i'd say chris sale would be my pick if we took the uh um he has insane reach though he so i think he would be hard because if he even knew how to fight a little bit which he seems like because he seems like a pretty you know I think he's from the South. It seems like kind of he knows how to handle himself maybe in the streets. He has that look where he has a lot of tattoos, knows his way around a knife. Could be could be like a guy that, that mugs you in the street if he wasn't playing baseball. If he even knew a, how to punch slightly, it would be a nightmare because he would be able to keep distance and then your reach would be half of his. So he'd just be peppering you with these you know, probably really frail, but over time effective jabs that would eventually wear you down. I think you still have a chance. I think because he's so tall, I could also duck under it all and go for some, go for the skinny legs and that, that would give me a chance. That's um, true. I think and take that out though, a pitch that needs to be recognized is, uh, what the hell is his name? The dude with the Indians. Um, Emmanuel Clace, I think it is. I think Clace is his last name. Their closer throws like a 100-mile-an-hour cutter. I think that's the pitch that I would want no matter what because then you're throwing a 100-plus-mile-an-hour fastball and a 100-mile-an-hour cutter. I just think that's the greatest combination there is. I'm looking him up now, so I have an idea. Uh... Yo, you've definitely seen his. You've definitely seen pitches from him on Pitching Ninja or something like that. Okay, fr- from the DR, definitely knows how to handle himself in a street fight. Pretty pretty rough country growing up. Doesn't look like he's... he's a big boy. Uh, yeah, it's hard to tell from pictures. 6'2", 206. So you guys are similar size. Oh. Wow, I would have thought he looks way what bigger are you, on six, TV. 6'1", one, one, 210, something like that. 215, 220. You brought you way more than him. You may more than him. At six six feet two fifteen. I, I I think Emmanuel Close is a good good choice. Just yeah. you, you gotta search him for weapons before. Those guys know those guys know how to stick it. Um, oh my god! So, so I wanted to end off with a question about more 
life and the meaning behind baseball. So we're obviously very close friends. I, I would say you're my best friend and we've played baseball together for over half a decade. I've watched you go on and do tremendous things in baseball, like playing the Olympics. You were signed to the Cubs. You've played different levels of professional baseball all over the country, all over the world, literally Australia, US, Europe, Japan. And you've also fought your way through so many injuries with your with your shoulder, with your hip. You've had you had that surgery where your stomach was cut open and you got mesh put into your body, so you're pretty much half robot at this point, which I think works to your advantage. For you, what keeps you playing baseball what what is your drive to keep playing baseball rooted in because people that have been through what you've been through and playing a sport that doesn't reward players financially as much as other sports that are at similar levels so you you, you probably get paid higher in other sports that in uh, like practice squad and football or you know, maybe the D league and the NBA. So the point is in minor league baseball, you don't really get that much financial compensation. So you're obviously not doing it for the money at this point. You, obviously you can go on to make millions of dollars in major league baseball. Um, and I believe you have the ability to do that for you. What keeps you playing through all these years? What is the drive at those points where you're questioning your career and you're, you have thought about, possibly not doing this anymore and i know you're at a point in your career where you're not done but you're at a point where you're considering other options and you're entering a, almost like the after period in your late 20s a lot of people start to think about their life like what what, what for you is the reason that you've kept on playing when other people would have given up yeah, I mean, first and foremost, from like a baseball standpoint, I think there's no better thrill in the world than um, having success on the baseball field. And I say this whenever I'm asked this question, I think more specifically, like walking off the mound after a scoreless inning, you know, punching out the last batter of the inning is for me, I am not the most like energetic and like fiery person. But like, that's when I feel that level of everything just like spike in my blood and in my veins and like I love that feeling I love that feeling of like walking off the mound after a punch out or a scoreless inning more than anything in this world and I want to be able to do that as long as possible um baseball has given me so much from experiences to try like you said traveling the world and the friendships and relationships that it has created for me like I'm so thankful for all the doors and opportunities that it has opened up and I just I think I just never want all of this to end um again it's just it's it's brought me so much and it's pretty much been what has defined me throughout my entire life um and i love every aspect of the game i love the preparation i love reporting to the clubhouse and having like downtime to hang out with the guys and then also kind of get in my own zone and my own element and prepare myself to do something where you know as a relief pitcher if you have a bad outing like you're you know a few of those if a few of those build up, like you might screw yourself up for the year. So there's so much that goes into such a short amount of time on the field, but also determines, you know, your ability to continue to play the game and how long your lifelong, your lifeline is in this game. Um, so, I mean, I just, it's given me so much. I have so much fun preparing and playing um, and the accomplishing feeling after a good outing, after a win, after, you know, winning an award or winning an event going to the olympics whatever it is those are feelings that really can't be topped in any other way possible and i just want to be able to have those for the rest of my life and i i mean i personally think it's the, the greatest game in the world yeah it is the greatest game in the world and the more i get away from it the more that i miss being part of it as a player and having conversations like this definitely brings me back to the moments that I enjoy the most, which is being on the field and actually 
feeling like the fucking man and competing against other people and also the more casual times where you're packing a dip in the locker room and, and talking about what the fuck you did that weekend before or bus rides or just like all the shit that goes into baseball. I think it attracts a very unique type of person, which I would put you in this box a hundred percent. You are very skilled, hardworking and disciplined. And also you know how to let loose more of this work hard, play hard mentality. I feel like baseball players are known for that where we get our work done and also we know how to have a good time and that leads to a type of culture that I miss being a part of a lot. And yeah, that, I think that's a, a great spot to end off. So thank you for joining me on this podcast. I will thank you. see you soon, as you, as you know. And yeah, this is a fucking blast. We'll do yeah, this again. Yeah, was. Thanks for having me. Hopefully uh, in a year or two. I think the last time we did one of these was I think we did it a year and a half ago together. So hopefully I'm still playing baseball or I guess in a year and a half, hopefully getting ready, you know, almost 100% back from surgery and uh, almost ready for the World Baseball Classic with Israel. And hopefully we can do something like that again when the uh, when the time comes. So thanks for having me. Um, it's great to see your beautiful face. Uh, your hair keeps growing. It looks incredible. Don't ever cut it. And I'll see you in a few days. Yeah, I know one thing for sure. Five years from now, you're either going to be pitching in Major League Baseball or you're going to be a two-way in Jose Canseco's roided out league in in Mexico. One of those two things (laughs) is going to happen. You will be a professional in either one of those two categories. I know for sure. I can predict the future. 60% of the time, number one time. It 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 will be number one. I have a feeling. All right, I'll talk to you soon, John. Peace. All right, so I have 